uh, who's produced an absolute stack of great records and also uh, manages Claire Bauer. You, you do manage Claire? Do, yeah. That's right. And um, we've got, sorry, I'm all over the place here. Uh, Mark Myers, who was uh, formerly of the Middle East, um, he now runs the Big Sister Studio in Cairns. And down the end, we have Jeff uh, Bolu, a member of Canadian band Your Favourite Enemies and uh, from Hopeful Tragedy Records. Um, so basically, there's kind of traditionally been a bit of a line in the sand um, going back in the past of the music industry between the talent and the people behind the scenes who kind of help the, you know, the artists get out there and, and get noticed. But that's kind of blurring a little bit, that line at the moment. Um, and these gentlemen up here are, are certainly proving that. Um, I, I just want to get started with kind of a really general question just to throw it out there. A, a lot of people aspire to be musicians, um, rock stars if you will. Not as many people aspire to be artist managers or, or, or engineers or, or what have you. Um, did you guys have aspirations to get into this other part of the, the music industry aside from performing? I could say that I didn't really ever think about it. Um, and even when I you know, got sort of <coughs> approached by people, I was still a bit unsure. But when I met pe the people that I was going to be working with, like the MD and the head of A&R, I thought, these people are really cool. Like they, and they love music and they're, they're you know, music fans. And all we talked about was music. And I was like, I didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect, but that kind of, that's why I ended up going for it. Because I thought I was really, really impressed with the passion and the love that people had for music, so I thought, why not try? Anyone else? Any uh, aspirations to be to be you know part of the industry in, in another uh, way? Yeah, I reckon I always had that thought that I would transfer over to the industry side after doing music for a while. I thought that would end up becoming my full-time job, even as kind of as a young kid. I think that's just like a business side of me that I always wanted to to get out there, essentially. And so it ended up happening. And uh, for me, coming from uh, from Montreal, um, and uh, which is a French, like <laughs> French uh, province, out of a huge English universe, um, we've had the privilege to have um, people like uh, Franz Schuler, who now runs Indica Records, who manages Half Moon Run, and also Gus Van Gogh, who now runs a huge studio in New York City. And um, those two guys were part of a band because. Um, we didn't have a choice, you know, they didn't have a choice. If they, we wanted to make it a little bit outside of Montreal, literally, you had to really just, um, you know, do everything by yourself and just, you know, run your own thing and, and just go out in the bushes and, like, do your, make it your own way, you know? So for us, seeing that really, like, inspired us in, a, in, a, in such a way that, you know, we realized at the same time, even if it was, like, years after, we faced the same issues, same things. We didn't have a choice. If we wanted to make it elsewhere than just our little super belle province, as they call it over there, we had to really, like, uh, you know, go our own way. How important were, were mentors for, for you guys? Uh, uh, obviously, uh, as you just touched on there, were, did, did you, were, was there any kind of particular person or, or group of people for, for any of you who kind of made you think, well, I, actually, maybe I, maybe I could do this. Go on, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember as a um, young bass player in a band, a manager handing me an envelope with cash in it and saying, when you get back from Melbourne, this will be full of receipts and it needs to balance, so please make that happen. And at that point, I realised, OK, I think this is maybe you know, some responsibility that I've been given that I might take into the future, so. It, did it balance? No. 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 <laughs> no. no. I had to fork some, you know, reach into my pocket, but, um, yeah. Because Sorry, what was your question? Well, it was more about, about um, kind of mentors, just, just touching what, what Jeff said, whether there was any, any figures in particular that kind of inspired you to... Well, f I think for me it was, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a band that I've been in for a long time and, you know, I felt, you know, you, you do know there's, a, there's an expiration date on a band and <clears throat> being a musician, so there's a point in my life at least where I kind of said to myself, I think subliminally it was like, I, you know, 
I can't do this forever, so I have to transition at some point. I actually, I actually went to university for a couple of years, <clears throat> but then naturally I kind of went, okay, well, this is what I understand. I need to learn more about it, and, and off I went <coughs> for me. I guess yeah. uh, probably particularly for, for Mark and Andy, when you kind of did transition into, into these new roles in the industry, was that met with opposition from, from friends or peers or...? Or anyone, um, at least vocally. I mean, you know, I didn't notice any. I'm sure. I don't know. <laughs> I'd, I'd hope not. But I, I mean, I, I'm just touching on what Andy was saying before. That I, the kind of the reason that that I kind of decided to jump into it as well is because I figured I hadn't learnt everything I need. You know, there's always new learning to do. You know, like I think if you kind of think that you know everything just because you've been in a band for ten years and you've done a lot of, you know, touring and whatever, you still got so much more to learn and for me it's that was one of the key th driving factors as well because you know you shouldn't ever stop trying to learn or trying to know something better if it's what you're interested in yeah. that's, I guess that's another reason I kind of pushed into you know this side <coughs> of the, the game. Uh, Mark uh, you've, you've made quite a few records has making records always been part of your plan from the from when you kind of started making music? Uh, yeah, I was definitely more interested in production than playing in a band. I think I realised at some point that I probably wasn't talented enough to play in a band and make money, and I think it probably came down to a financial thing as well. I thought, well, I quite enjoy making music, um, so I figured that seemed like a more uh, attainable sort of goal, I suppose. And even with the Middle East, I was just in the band to try and get better at production and attract other bands by playing in a cool band. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. D did it take a, a long time to kind of uh, adjust from, from, you know, being in a band, a band that was doing a lot of stuff um, right up until the point where you split, um, to not doing that and then shifting your focus kind of solely onto what you're doing now? I think when we got back from overseas, I started recording some other bands. I think I recorded Emma Louise while I was still playing in the Middle East and then I kind of found out that the band was splitting up a little bit before it split up so I started making the transition. Um, it wasn't too bad because I feel like the money in the music industry sort of takes a while to come through so uh, I think I got more money once the band split up and so it kind of helped the transition anyway. Trying to, I'm not trying to make it sound all about money here but it's coming out that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to lead on to my next question really nicely, so I'm glad that you're talking about money. Um, I, I think in the, the kind of brief for this, there was uh, talk about um, art meeting commerce. Um, and look, I mean, it's, it's an interesting kind of concept. <coughs> um, have any of you guys ever felt when you're making decisions that this could really impact on my artistic work? That this could, this could have a, this could be good for me financially or commercially or whatever, but artistically might not be the best decision? I mean, that, that's the fine line that you walk sometimes, you know. It's, you, you can be offered, <coughs> as an artist or a band, you can be offered opportunities that may, you know, sully the name or, or, or not put you in the, the best light or piss your fans off or whatever, and it, it might be worth some decent money. So you've got to work out, you know, what's a good thing to do and what's not a good thing. You know, some of the best things to do in the world, are, are, you know, you don't get paid, you know, but some of the shittiest things you get paid a lot, you know, decent money, so you've got to work out what's good for you, I think, in the end. But I think it's important to always keep hold of, you know, what, what, you, what, what you are as a band or an artist or a group, that, that is the key to what you do and how people perceive that and, and whether, you know, how they engage in it, whether they love it, you know, what they want to, you know, engage with you on that level. So you can't mess with that at all. Do you get better at that? What do you, what as, do you as time goes on, better at making those decisions. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and 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 as you know, as your act sort of grows, <coughs> you have more leeway. You know, I think that, that you know a young band can come out, you know, make a write an incredible song on their laptop in their basement. You know, Nick Fenlay will put it on Triple J two weeks later. You know, you might have played two shows. And then a month later, someone might offer you some decent money to do, you know, whatever, a Coke commercial or something. You might go, great, I'll take $100,000 to do that, and then your career's over. 
or it could it could be something else which actually helps you make your record and mm. sends you on that path. So you've always got to be careful. But you know, as a band gets older, as they get more established, they can get away with it a little more. I think. I mean, you know, Mark, you would know you would have been in those situations with yeah, Jet. You know, absolutely. Everyone knows that we we kind of you know like let a song be used on like an iPod commercial, which at the time was like a really tricky decision because, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was, you know, 2003 or four. Well, now it would totally be a no brainer for most bands, you know, like, but the band, it was still like a tricky decision because of, I guess, public perception was more that if you did that, you were kind of selling out, but now like people would, you know, jump over their mother to get the, uh, the Apple iPod commercial yeah. for their band, and it, would, it totally, and it launches, you know, launches careers, and this, it, it's, a, a, and it become another way, another kind of radio almost, mm. in a way. I remember when that happened for you guys, and it was almost like that thing is what they have been, you know, given or what they're involved in is so big, it's like fucking hell. And that again, that wasn't and, a and so you completely got away with it, and and the question on everybody's lips was, did they get paid a million? No, you get paid fuck all to do that. <laughs> they know, they know, they know what, how good, how much of an exposure you're going to get out of it. So they're not going to. Everyone's like, "Did you get free iPods?" And I'm like, "Dude, we didn't even hardly get paid." <laughs> but you're everywhere. Yeah, everywhere around the world. Yeah. For like, you know, and and to, so you know, like it's and it was the the way we justified it was that it was a cool piece of music. Technology. It was def definitely the right product. And yeah, yeah I mean that's the thing. Like, you get right. these these opportunities come up all the time, and it's the one you, you've got to be good at saying no to things, and it's that's the that's the struggle. That's the line you got to walk. You know, you got to like we're saying, you got to toss up where you think it's going to work for you, or, and I think you've got to just back your decision as well. You know, you make the decision, you make it, and the, there's no true wrong decisions. You know, like it's a decision you made, and you just got to deal with it if, it if it turns out to be something you wish you didn't do you know it's like at the time it was the right decision because maybe it allowed you to buy the equipment to make your record or whatever but yeah, yeah, I, I, I gotta say I think these days there there are more of those opportunities to you know take whatever you want to call it corporate dollar or sponsorship money or whatever and I think that it's really key to um, you know bands actually sort of getting some cash flow and not doing it in a way where they have to sign, you know, an agreement to do something for a period of time, whether it's a recording agreement or a publishing agreement or whatever. It's purely, you know, you get involved in our brand, we take your coolness, add it to it, and we pay you money. I think you can get away with that a lot more than, than what you used to, as Mark was saying. I mean, you know... It was very different, like, you know, in 2000 or whatever, it was just so completely frowned upon. Oh, I mean, I, I remember in... I remember you and I were had a, an American record out, Touring America, and, and there was a Budweiser sponsorship thing that we got offered, and it was a shitload of money. We actually turned it down because we thought it was just too uncool to... But at the time, it kind of was, you know. Some, like, back yeah. then, that, that could have been a killer, but now it's completely different, yeah. you know. I mean, we, we, we would have had deposits for houses mm. straight away at 22 years old, so... Or three, so... But we turned it down. But I think now... Do you think that was the right decision at the time? Or like, well, like it's, I was it's hard to say, actually. I mean, I could probably turn... I, I might have been able to turn around and say, we did that, it was really uncool for three months, people hated us, but then they forgot <coughs> about it two years later. Mm. And I bought a house. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's that... You know, the, my point is I think perception is always changing and I think brands and music and, you know, your associations with things uh, are, are, are more blurred these days, which I think is a good thing if you can get the balance right for bands. It's kind of 